the Puget Sound Navy Museum's Anchored in History tour program. Today we're at Seattle's Magnuson Park, which formerly served as Naval Air Station Seattle. It was the very first naval aviation facility in the Pacific Northwest. Thanks for exploring it with me. Sand Point is a peninsula on the western shore of Lake Washington. It's about six miles northeast of downtown Seattle, which made it downright rural back in the 1920s. Though today, as you can see, it's much more urban. Its location near water was very important at the beginning because the Navy actually used seaplanes more frequently than land-based planes. Though this would change by the 1930s, it was definitely a factor in choosing Sandpoint for the location of the new airfield. Sandpoint also had several other advantages. It was fairly level, flat land with no steep slopes. There was nothing already in the way, like buildings, power lines, or big trees. Its location on a peninsula made it easy to spot from the air. And finally, it was accessible to Seattle by both railroad and roadways. Now this was just barely true. It was connected to the rest of the city by a single dirt road, the route of which would eventually become Sandpoint Way Northeast. Back in the early 1900s, Sandpoint was mostly farmland and kind of swampy, but that was about to change. When the Lake Washington Ship Canal opened in 1917, it lowered Lake Washington by eight feet and helped to dry out much of Sandpoint. And then with World War I, there was a growing local interest in military aviation. Rear Admiral Robert E. Kuntz, who was in charge of Bremerton's Puget Sound Navy Yard at the time, pushed for an airfield to be built within reasonable flying distance of his shipyard. King County ended up taking on the project first, buying about 200 acres of Sandpoint farmland. The groundbreaking ceremony took place in June of 1920, a century ago this summer, but it wasn't until the end of that decade that it would start to resemble a working base. In the 1920s, there was a single army surplus hangar and a primitive grass landing strip. Headquarters was an old farmhouse, and aviators stayed in the chicken house. That's pretty hard to imagine as you look around the site today. We begin our tour here at the north entrance to Magnuson Park along Northeast 74th Street. This original brick entrance gatehouse dates to 1942. Just outside, this monument recognizes one of the air station's historic firsts. In 1924, U.S. Army pilots began and ended the very first flight around the world here. After flying 30,000 miles, the aviators returned to a crowd of nearly 50,000 people. Soon after, the World Flight Monument was unveiled. This granite monument, topped with a crown of bronze wings, is the earliest existing object at the former air station, making it a fitting start to today's tour. That was only the first of Sandpoint's historic aviation moments. Charles Lindbergh landed here during his visit to Seattle in 1927, just months after his historic flight, a solo crossing of the Atlantic. Throughout the 1920s, the airfield was a departure point for various expeditions, including an attempt to transit the North Pole and aerial mapping of Alaska. The Navy leased the site from King County in 1922, and it was deeded to the Navy in 1926. As you continue into the historic district, you'll notice a number of historic buildings from its time as a naval airfield. The dispensary, the administrative headquarters, a giant storehouse, the firehouse and the gas station are just a few of the surviving buildings. The park's historic district features more than 20 brick and metal structures built in the 1930s and 1940s. Architecture buffs will note that the buildings of Sandpoint's historic district feature a mix of Art Deco, Colonial Revival, and Art Modern styles. Here in front of the air station's original dispensary is the Freedom Tree. This 60-foot tall cedar was planted in the 1930s. It was rededicated as part of the Vietnam Memorial in 1972, honoring Washington state soldiers declared as missing in action or prisoners of war. Today, most of the largest buildings in the historic district are airplane hangars. You can see Building 2 from 1929, Building 27 from 1937, and Buildings 30, 32, and 33 all completed in 1939. These massive steel-framed hangars provided airplane overhauls and repairs, as well as training programs critical to sustaining the nation's defense. 
While hangars are essential to the operation of the airfield, this work also requires a lot of people and they need somewhere to live. Over time, quite a few barracks buildings and officers' quarters were constructed here. Many of them are still standing. Just inside the Northeast 74th Street gate, along 62nd Avenue Northeast, you'll find the original living quarters for both bachelor and married officers, as well as the barracks building for enlisted men. These were all built starting in 1929 through the World War II years, and were occupied by the Navy into the 1950s. Today, much of it is used for affordable housing. Across the street from this housing is Building 47, the Recreation Building. Dedicated in December of 1941, it gave sailors something to do in their downtime. Today, as Magnuson Community Center, it serves much the same purpose it did all those years ago. The Air Station's operations and staff increased dramatically during World War II. Runway paving began just before the war, with five runways completed by September of 1941 enabling the air station to handle significantly more traffic. Aircraft carriers being repaired at Bremerton's Puget Sound Naval Shipyard would fly their planes here for repairs. The station also served as the supply point for all aircraft materials needed throughout the 13th Naval District, a huge undertaking. At its peak, nearly 8,000 civilian and military personnel provided aircraft repairs, pilot training, and other naval aviation services. Units that were equipped or trained at Sandpoint participated in some of the critical battles in the Pacific War. It's important to note that many of the air station's new employees were women who had enlisted in the Navy as WAVES, or Women Accepted for Volunteer Emergency Service. They worked all over the Naval Air Station, in communications, the control tower, recreation, and ship services, as aviation machinists, parachute riggers, storekeepers, photographer's mates, pharmacist mates, switchboard officers, and much more. After the Korean War, the Navy ordered Naval Air Station Seattle to essentially close except for reserve activity. The aircraft repair and maintenance function would shift to another location. The city of Seattle's continued growth, coupled with the air station's reduced mission, led to the end of flight operations here in 1970. The station was renamed Naval Support Activity Seattle. Over the next 25 years, it provided logistical services for Puget Sound and Pacific naval operations. Slowly, Sandpoint transitioned away from Navy uses. In 1970, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, took over about 120 acres of the air station's north end. By 1977, about 200 acres had become a park named for U.S. Senator Warren G. Magnuson. Magnuson championed many local causes, including the region's Navy bases. He was a naval veteran himself, having served aboard USS Enterprise during World War II. Throughout the 1970s and 1980s, the Navy retained the rest of the former air station for the continued operation of Naval Support Activity Seattle, but this was not to last. In 1995, all U.S. Navy operations officially ended here. The former Naval Air Station now serves a variety of purposes, including institutional, recreational, and residential uses, in addition to Magnuson Park. Heading into the park itself, though there are no giant warehouses or airplane hangars, there are still traces of its past as a naval airfield. Look closely for structures like these, an arch-shaped magazine built in 1936. The park also houses two Navy-themed art installations. From Swords to Plowshares, a sculpture by John T. Young installed in 1998 has been described by the artist as a global monument to world peace and recycling. It features the diving plane fins from 22 U.S. Navy submarines built in the 1960s, scattered across about 500 feet of the park. The artist says, Cited there, the artwork serves as a positive historic monument of the Navy's involvement on the site. This artwork is also one of the first memorials in the United States to honor those men and women who served our country during the Cold War. The second art installation, which begins near the southern entrance to the park, is Straight Shot by Perry Lynch. It follows the original path of Runway B, the air station's longest runway. 
Though the landing strips and runways were removed in the 1970s, you can still see where they once were through this 2007 art installation. For the more adventurous explorers, the area offshore has even more to explore. During its years of operation, Naval Station Puget Sound was used as a facility to train naval aviators. As you might expect, several trainer aircraft were forced to ditch in Lake Washington due to pilot error or aircraft malfunction. In 1947, a PV-2 harpoon crashed on its approach to the runway. In 1956, a PB-4Y privateer crashed shortly after takeoff when the pilot missed setting the flaps. The wrecks of these aircraft still remain submerged near the park. They rest about 150 feet below the surface and are often visited by local divers. As you visit the waterfront, think about the many boats and planes that have operated here over the years, starting in the 1920s with seaplanes and early naval aviation. Naval history of a different sort was made in 1950 when the revolutionary hydroplane Slow Motion 4 set a world speed record just offshore from Sandpoint. This is just a sample of the Navy connections you can find at Magnuson Park. I hope you'll take the chance to visit in person to see what else you can find. Though no longer an active naval installation, Sandpoint proved the need for a vital air presence in the Pacific Northwest. This airfield saw many significant moments of local history. Thank you for joining me on this tour. Next up, on August 15th, we're headed back over to Bremerton for our next tour location, so keep an eye on this page.